Yeah, generalization is an important word. And I think people also think of it as like patterns, but I don't know if that's too abstract for you. But let's just, this just might get messy and I'll probably try sure. and just edit out some of my stuff, but I really want to nah. hear your thoughts on it. So when we have ideas, I feel like already back then you were imagining what uh, is becoming more obvious now in the study of the hippocampus, which is that something like memory and something like navigation are kind of the same thing, just yeah. in the same way that when you, you you often talk about it depends on what you're looking for, or it depends on how you've set up the exper experiment, or it depends on what all this come before. You can't uh, separate what you're looking for and finding and labeling from this whole trajectory of the way the experiment is set up or where we are in the world or what we're, what the goal is that I think a lot of your work shows that in different ways. But the reason I start with sustain and, and going into the hippocampus is because I feel like the model itself is kind of set up to be agnostic about yeah. all of these labels in a way that's becoming very important now. It feels like, because yeah. just to, to give a brief uh, recap, at the time, people thought the hippocampus is all about memory. And then, of course, the play cells, grid cells, border cells had all been labeled, found uh, by this time, too. And so it was like, oh, the hippocampus is about navigation. And so there's been this, what is it? The hippocampus is memory. It's knowledge acquisition. It's a GPS. And it all seemed very different. But if you just look at your model and what it's doing, all those things can be the same process, which I gets to later, later papers that you've done. But oh, I want to... Yeah throw that out there and see what you think. No, no, no. This is not a digression. This is spot on. And yeah, really early on in my thinking, I, I always saw it exactly that way. Like that it's, there's just this one general like learning procedure. And like you said, you could apply it to different domains, things with different labels, uh, different basically subfields in, in neuroscience. And it's just the same procedure. And yeah, even when I was writing up stuff, I wanted to say say this like more strongly, but I thought it's really funny. I noticed one of your guests recently was Lynn Nadell, and I mm -hmm. this is years ago, but I was giving a talk at Arizona, I think, where he I think he still works there or is yeah, affiliated he's still there. there. And, and I had Retired, a personal meeting. Um, mm -hmm. oh, okay, good. We have more time for fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I brought this up like very sheepishly that oh, isn't it all this? I thought he, I, I don't know why I thought he would hate it or something but he's like oh no that totally makes sense and uh, yeah it's, I, mean, I mean i hope i'm not really this is decades later i'm sure what he said was way more subtle but i just took it as like i'm not a crazy person but yeah but what you're referring and to, what were you saying to him exactly that, that uh, space that, uh, is just, similar to concepts or something yeah that just it just seems like they're all the same operations of of what's what's going on in these different domains and yeah yeah obviously people know that the hippocampus is, is implicated in these wildly different on the surface behaviors like in navigation episodic memory but yeah it just it always seemed that way and it's just i, I think yeah i think the field got off course because there are things even from like higher level cognition when, when i was starting out going way back there's all these ideas that like space is a primitive that structures higher level concepts and it kind of makes sense. You use language like I'm feeling down today, but that is also cases where it doesn't make sense. Like you're closer to me, I'm closer to you than you are to me. Like doesn't really make sense. Space mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a lot of evidence that that's, that can be true that we could form representations in one domain, like spatial ones and apply them to others. I mean, we make analogies all the time, but the question I'm really interested in is what's the machinery under that built those representations in the first place? And I think it really is something like these sort of incremental clustering and whether you're talking of, there's a whole other dimension that we're not even discussing, which is time. And I think it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Once again, I always saw this way, like in event perception where, why do you segment off an event? It's because something surprising happened. People call it a boundary, but it's just basically like prediction broke down and then you noted it. And then it all just kind of blurred together after that got stored all and wrapped up and integrated into one bundle in, in your head. But, but yeah, 100%. So like yeah, more recent work, like you indicated, has pushed that saying you can use these same simple clustering mechanisms to look at why you get grid cell responses. And also like you picked up on like very astutely is that like when you're going to see these kind of responses or not see them, it's like not something that's built in. It's this interplay between the mechanism, the model and the environment and the task that's going on. So it's I think it really is 
all the same. Like, not because, like, I'm just naturally, like, a bundler as opposed to a separator. I think in this case, it's just, like, I mean, it's not crazy. There's this brain area. And it, there's these related operations across these domains. And why, why shouldn't it be that way? Yeah, It's... I think that goes back to that simplicity that's complicated. Uh, Yeah. because basically, I think what you've even said, it's a general learning system, which makes sense. And we can use that for what we talk about as memory. We can use it for what we talk about as the GPS. I think what gets, is that right? The, the idea of a general Yeah, learning, yeah. yeah. But I think what gets hard is, and we, we should be careful, it's not either or, right? Because I feel like this could be just saying, oh, well, there's no such thing. And, and in some of your papers too, I wonder about it if you've gotten pushback. It's like saying, okay, we don't really need to, this idea of a concept cell or a place cell or a grid cell, you could almost, and it has almost become clear that we could name cells by almost everything, right? There's cells that fire every time you see Jennifer Aniston, which are called Jennifer Aniston cells, these kind of concept cells or, and, but actually it's very important that that was found out. And Yeah. those are very important discoveries. And actually they, they add to all this. So it's not an either or like, that we can now understand it, begin to, un to understand it as a general learning system comes from all of that. And it doesn't mean all of that is now not there. It's just that we are going to kind of zoom out and see it a little bit better, maybe, right? Or broader, Yeah, yeah. or how I do mean, you... there, yeah. I mean, there's there's so much to say. I mean, I guess one thing that I never really resonated about, just like discovering. cell types or like concept cells, Jennifer Anderson cells, place cells and so forth. And it almost just feels like that's not at all an explanation. It's it almost like we're talking about being children and then it, it feels like, because it's going to get me in trouble, but it, it almost feels like a very childlike view of what science is. Like, like someone like going through the jungle, oh, I found a new kind of butterfly or, or this, or I went fishing, I put mixed a bunch of chemicals together and I discovered something or Eureka. It, or like I've been fishing around in brains and I found a cell that does this. So I solved it. Like, I mean, it's it, other things in science and psychology like that too. Like even the things that look totally the opposite, like the Gibsonian direct perception always seemed like that. I mean, I really like that in like linking to the environment, ecological psychology, but it was always like, Oh, there's no representations. You just, can, you just, you just know this. Cause there's an invariant. I'm like, okay, but something has to compute that and process that. And like, just like these cells, you get a cell that, lights up when you see Jennifer Aniston. That just, it's not like someone just put that cell in your head. You don't have like a, or you say, oh, the brain's GPS. It's like the brain doesn't have a GPS. Something is computing the stuff and there's things being transformed. I mean, even if you don't take the computational view of the brain, there's just a lot of intermediate steps that are leading uh, to that outcome. And to me, that's like the interesting thing to explain how it comes about. Maybe this is like a little too, Because you're doing a very good thing of like trying to say that oh, we could integrate all the stuff and everything's valuable, but just to be No, negative you should say for what you some, think. I mean. yeah, yeah. It's just it's so like this, yeah, just like a recent paper that's under review now, where it's really actually questioning whether there is a lot of scientific value to identifying these cell types. And um, this wasn't the kind of process explanatory models that we were discussing earlier. This is really just taking an existing deep learning model and showing that if you put it in the kind of enclosures we put like rodents in to find these kind of cells in a VR environment and feed it in, you basically, even in a random network, you'll see these kinds of cell types and they look a lot like the ones in the brain. It's not saying they're not real or they don't have value or you have no causal efficacy or that the brain can't have interpretable cells because I don't think the brain cares about us what kind of whether it's interpretable or not interpretable to us but it's just sort of saying that the discovery alone of these things that might not actually have scientific value because they could come about because it's actually doing what you think it's doing or it could just come about doing a completely different function as a network it does something completely unrelated to what you're studying so that kind of goes back to what i was saying before to make it more positive that you need to kind of do the figure out what the underlying mechanism is and the role of those cells and like a, a larger computation. And so I, I think it's like the priorities of science are a bit screwed up because the discovery, it, that to me, it's not a discovery. It's just sort of like, it's like finding a butterfly versus understanding how it works or its life cycle or something more. That's like the science. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, we get confused sometimes about a couple of things, I think. I, I mean, 
One is that, of course, we want to discover new things, and that can seem like science, where, like with the butterfly, you discover a new species, and then you put your name on it or something, you know? Yeah. And and I think there's something motivating about that that's not bad, but you can go too far to where that becomes the focus, and as you're pointing out, that's actually not, I'm not sure that's going to help the butterflies uh, live longer or be healthier or have a better environment or something. Like, what are we really doing when we when we talk about Yeah. that? We could say that about the brain, too, but... Also, I think if I go back to like the 70s or when when there was all this going on with the hippocampus, with HM, with the first kind of discovery of the play cell, you know, actually, I feel like that was a very important shift in terms of the same thing that your model is helping us understand, which is there are regularities in the world that are, I mean, this is hard because it's not, they don't map to, people always say map to or map onto, but there's a kind of Uh, representation or map of it as the body like this these things aren't separate so they're both showing us that there's some really amazing relationship between the way the body and the brain are and the way the world is as regularities that you can actually study and understand this is like kind of a huge Yeah. Yeah, thing no, I think right that's really exciting too. Yeah, I share your passion for yeah this. <laughs> yeah. so i guess it, it's I still see all that discovery, place cells, GPS, memory, HM is really important, but I feel like the story's got to widen a bit. And I, I, I think you're being, you, you, you would be harsher than I'm being about the importance of that stuff, which is, you would have more of a background of how to understand it. But I guess what I'm trying to, to get at is like, can we just think of this as like a general learning system and something like sustain or these models start to help us understand the more nuance we can get, the more the technology gets, can we start to do what I think you've been trying to do? And that's take the context into consideration, take the experiment itself and all the ways it's been developed into consideration, into the metrics. Is are we Can we do that? Does any of this make Yeah. sense what Yeah. I'm Yeah. saying? I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to sound like all negative because uh, things are progressing. And I think a lot of people are trying to do what, what, what you're saying. And it could just be like, so maybe one reason I, I was seeming more negative is because like labeling these things by like their function almost like shuts down the scientific discussion because Like a lot of what we've been saying, what you just said was about like how the different tasks, contexts affect things that like the place cell does a lot more than it's affected by so many things by reward and, you know, every, they're not, you need to look at the actual, I mean, they're just messier too than they're shown in the paper, like in, when, when the thing, how things are actually done. And that's setting aside all the steps that went through and kind of before something ends up being recorded and reported in a paper. But, but yeah, so, but this goes on like all over neuroscience. Like, so and again, I'm not really against these research areas, but it seems like it's bad to label things by their function because it's kind of assumes, you know, the answer. So we have, you know, areas in the brain, like the fusiform face area, like it shouldn't be called face area because that sort of like assumes what it does and that the story's over. But, and that seems kind of obvious because then you could have like all kinds of debates. Is it, Is it really just faces or is it sort of just fine grain perceptual distinctions? Is it visual expertise? And so like, there's a lot of, that's not my area of research, but there's like a lot of rich questions that would take decades to resolve and subtle things. But in a way, it's, so it shouldn't be called that the same way. Like, I don't think it's just semantics either because you call something a place cell, a grid cell and this. It's almost like you're just assuming what it is or how it works and and maybe like closing your your mind off to like the richer deeper explanation that will inevitably follow that is following but maybe it would come along faster if we didn't have these viewpoints and attitudes towards eureka i found this thing or that thing or Yeah. yeah And as you're talking, it's also it, it even if, if the person who's presenting it doesn't mean for it to be, it becomes that it can only be that thing, which is also not really true about the brain and body. The same cell or group of cells can have many different kind of firing or let's say names or labels, depending on the context or the way the experiment is set up or what the body's doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely.